New videos coming up soon on JGA and JG7. Been moving apartments to build the all new JG9 studios, which has put things on the back burner for just a little bit, but we're going to be back in business very shortly. Make sure to check the link in the description to join those channels now. And now, on with our feature presentation. A while ago, I made a video about this man right here, San Diego Chargers running back Sid Edwards. If you want to learn more about that situation, you can do so by clicking the card in the upper right corner. However, to make a long story short, during the 1974 season, head coach Tommy Prothrow decided to suspend his running back, Sid Edwards. Now by itself, this isn't exactly much of a story. Coaches suspend players all the time for conduct detrimental to the team, or for an outburst, or for not showing up to practice on time, or for a variety of reasons. But what made this suspension all the more bizarre was the fact that never, not once, did Coach Prothrow actually give a reason as to why Edwards was suspended. No one knew what he did. Heck, not even Sid Edwards himself knew what he did or why he was being suspended. And this whole incident shows a very important element of effective punishment and how not to do it. When you punish someone and keep him around, the goal is rehabilitation. The goal is to understand why the player is being punished, that this is unacceptable, and that by informing the player about why this is bad through your words and through your actions, that they will not repeat that same mistake again when they're given a second chance after the time frame for the punishment has expired. Otherwise, what's the point? Sending a kid to timeout because he threw a tantrum in the store when he couldn't buy the new shiny toy is one thing, but sending a kid to timeout for no reason whatsoever is just bad parenting all the way around. And bonus points if you're the coach responsible for carrying out the punishment, and yet you have no idea yourself what the offender did. That's just insanely dysfunctional. Well, that's exactly what happened with this man right here. This is running back Andy Livingston, and even though his time with the New Orleans Saints was relatively short, he made a lasting impact in both a positive and a negative way with the franchise. On the positive side, as we'll see in a bit, he was an awfully good player, and was one of the bright spots on some really bad early Saints teams. On the negative side, well, he might be the player involved in one of the strangest, craziest, and quite frankly, dumbest suspensions in the history of the franchise. Because much like the Sid Edwards suspension a few years later that I talked about, not a whole lot about this one made any sense. Because this is the story behind the stupidest suspension in the over half century long history of the New Orleans Saints franchise. Before I talk about the actual suspension in question, and what exactly made no sense about it from any standpoint at all, we need some context to understand just who Andy Livingston was, and how he was playing before all of this went down. The year is 1969, and after four years with the Chicago Bears, where he didn't do a whole lot of anything, being buried on the depth chart, Andy Livingston found himself in the New Orleans Saints following a trade a few months before the start of the regular season in exchange for a future draft pick. And while the Saints made many bad roster moves during the 1960s, which is kind of a given considering how bad they were, this was not one of them. Not at all. Because in 1969, Andy Livingston was a key part in an offense that actually finished the season 6th in points scored and 3rd in total yards. In fact, during the 1969 season, Andy Livingston was one of the best running backs in football, as the one-two punch of he and Tony Baker was a combination that not a whole lot of opposing defenses wanted to face. I'll put it that way. Livingston led the Saints that season with 761 rushing yards and 5 rushing touchdowns, and did this while averaging 4.2 yards per carry. On top of that, he led the team in total touchdowns, scoring eight, while being one of two players on the team 
to have over a thousand yards from scrimmage. During the 1969 season, Livingston finished inside the top 10 of the entire NFL in rushing yards, yards per carry, rushing touchdowns, and yards from scrimmage. He was an incredibly well-rounded player. And just to give you an idea of how good and how versatile he was, in 1969, there were just three players in the NFL to have over a thousand yards from scrimmage, multiple rushing touchdowns, and multiple receiving touchdowns. Those three players were Tom Maddy, the legendary running back on the Baltimore Colts, Joe Morrison, the longtime running back on the New York Giants, and none other than the man of the hour himself, Andy Livingston. And for his efforts, Livingston was named a Pro Bowler, becoming the first offensive player in Saints history to receive this honor. Livingston is the answer to the trivia question of who was the first player on offense to ever make the Pro Bowl for the Saints. So after just one season with the team, his name was etched forever in history. However, despite a very good 1969 season from an individual perspective, the 1970 season was the exact opposite. Turns out, despite Livingston being a good player, he was having trouble staying healthy. A knee operation kept him out for part of the preseason, and after just one game, which was a 14-3 loss on opening day to the Atlanta Falcons, in which he had 10 carries for 29 yards, he missed the rest of September and the rest of October with the same issue of having a bad knee. Obviously, this was a huge blow to the Saints, who went from having one of the best rushing attacks in football to having one of the worst, as in their first seven games, they only crossed the 100-yard barrier for rushing yards once. When all was said and done, the Saints, with Livingston's absence, ranked 24th out of 26 teams in rushing yards, 24th in rushing touchdowns, and 22nd in yards per carry a far cry from what they were doing in 1969. In other words, no matter how you want to slice it, that's abysmal on so many levels. And unfortunately, there was nothing that Andy Livingston could do about it, seeing as his knee was bad and he couldn't play. But even if Livingston wanted to play, he could. Because prior to the team's Week 7 game against the Los Angeles Rams, this man right here, head coach Tom Fears decided to suspend him. Not even 24 hours before the NFC West battle, Fears decided to lay the hammer on Livingston and suspend him from the team. Whether he was even going to be healthy enough to play in this game or not, I'm not sure. So that raises a very obvious and a very valid question. Why was Andy Livingston suspended? Did he not show up to rehab sessions or a practice? Did he say something bad to the press or get into an argument with one of his teammates or coaches? Well, that's the thing. We have no idea. When Tom Fierro suspended Andy Livingston, he gave no reason whatsoever for the suspension. No reason to the press, no reason to Livingston, nothing. There are some rumors that it had to do with something that happened during training. But again, the player himself had no idea about what he did in order to get suspended and miss some time. That seems like horrible coaching, doesn't it? It's one thing to be a disciplinarian and to punish people, especially in the midst of what has been a horrible season, seeing as prior to this game, the Saints were 1-4-1 one one and were completely out of it but at least have a reason behind it. Giving no reason for the action? How is a player supposed to know what not to do again if you don't tell it? But hang on, because it gets worse. By itself, this is a bizarre story, but trust me, it's going to get even more bizarre. Because this man right here, Tom Fuse, aside from the fact that he was not a good head coach, and probably had no business being a head coach, seeing as the year before he took over the Saints, he was the offensive coordinator for one year for the Atlanta Falcons, who had literally the worst offense in the NFL, his days with the Saints were numbered. 
The saints were completely unraveling by this point. By all accounts, Fears had lost the team, and there were questions about the team's effort. And after their fourth straight game without a win, when they lost 30-17 to to the Rams, in a game that they did not have Livingston in due to the aforementioned suspension, the Saints decided to make a long overdue change at head coach. The only head coach in franchise history that the team had, Tom Fears, after three and a half seasons, was gone. And stepping into the fold was this man right here, J.D. Roberts. Now, Roberts was a bit of a weird hire from the middle of the season, and this will become very important later on. Usually, when a new coach is brought on in the middle of the season, it's a promotion from one of the position groups or a coordinator spot. It's a coach that knows the players, that has been in all the practices, and knows how things are done, and knows the system. But J.D. Roberts? He's somewhat of an outsider. On one hand, he was employed by the Saints before this. On the other hand, he was employed as the head coach of the Richmond Roadrunners, which was the Saints minor league affiliate in the Atlantic Coast Football League. Why the Saints picked him in the middle of the season, seeing as he was up in Richmond and knew nothing about the Major League Saints, is another story for another time. However, one of his first orders of business was deciding what to do about Andy Livingston. Remember, this is not a one-game suspension that was issued by Fears, nor was it a league-issued suspension with a definite ending. This was an indefinite suspension issued by the team's head coach, but a suspension that this head coach did not issue, seeing as the coach that issued it got fired. However, despite everything, in an absolutely absurd move, head coach Jamie Roberts decided not to lift the suspension. When asked about why he was not lifting Livingston's suspension, he said, if he was suspended by Tom Fears, I'm sure there was a reason for it. And as far as I'm concerned, he will remain suspended unless there's some other things I don't know about. I'm sorry, what? First off, Tom Fears himself had no idea why he suspended Livingston. He never gave a reason to him or the press. So your justification for keeping Livingston suspended boiled down to Fears must have had a good reason for it, and I'm not one to go against him. Even though Fears literally did not have a good reason for it, you don't even know why he got suspended. You didn't talk to him or any of his assistants. You were living in Richmond, coaching a completely different team when this went down. You never got the 411 from anyone as to why he was suspended. And you're coming in with the ability to start clean and saying, eh, I don't know why Livingston was suspended, but he was. So he's going to continue to be suspended. Imagine if you're a substitute teacher and you're filling in for a third grade class because the regular teacher is out that day. And the teacher leaves you a note saying, make sure that Billy Robinson doesn't get to go outside for recess, and that you push his desk all the way to the back corner of the classroom and make him sit there. I'm not sure why I issued this punishment to him or what he did to deserve it, but make sure that it continues. Let's be real. If you were the substitute teacher and you got that note, what the heck would you do with it? Why are we forcing a kid to sit in the corner and miss recess? You're just following the nonsensical orders from the previous regime? Come on. If you have no idea why you're issuing the punishment, then here's a crazy thought. Don't issue the punishment. Especially if you didn't see any of this go down. And obviously, I'm not saying that if you do something bad and a new person is in charge, that all punishment should be wiped away. If the prison gets a new maximum security guard, he shouldn't just let everyone go and be free again. But if you have no idea why a punishment is being issued, and literally no one in the organization has a clue as to why, then maybe it's not a good idea to have that punishment. 
Livingston never played another game in the NFL, as after he was eventually reinstated, he had some more knee problems, then tried to sign with the Philadelphia Eagles in 1971 before failing a physical there, ending his career just 18 months after being one of the top players in the entire league. But his exit from the Saints and his exit from the NFL? Considering the circumstances of a bizarre suspension that no one has any answers for whatsoever, has to be up there with one of the weirdest segs, etc. Just to recap, player gets suspended by Coach A. Coach A doesn't say anything to anyone about why he got suspended. Coach A gets fired. Coach B comes in from hundreds of miles away to take over. Coach B has no idea why the player got suspended. But Coach B decided to keep the suspension intact because Coach A must have had a reason for it. Even though Coach A and Coach B were not working together, and Coach A admitted himself that he had no reason. If that's not the sign of a dysfunctional organization, then quite frankly, I don't know what is. Because in 1970, the Orleans Saints running back Andy Livingston was definitely not living it up. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jj9shop.com and be sure to like and subscribe as it really helps the channel out a lot. Join me every Wednesday night where we'll play NFL trivia for cash prizes at 9 p.m. Eastern over on Twitch. To learn more about the history of college football, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To learn more about the history of Major League Baseball, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 7. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.